right now. So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Monica McCubrey. I am the Wildlife Education Specialist with the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission here in the Lincoln office. And today we're going to be talking about the science of shrews, voles, and moles. So three things that people don't know a ton about usually. Um, there are people obviously that are experts on these things and we will talk about that today. Um, but uh, we're going to just kind of give you a little brief introduction about these three species, how they compare, how they contrast, some really cool little things about each one of them. Do we have all of them in Nebraska? I don't know. We'll have to see here. Um, so before we get started, I do want to have my co-host um, and moderator today go ahead and introduce herself. So Amber, if you'd like to take it away. Yeah. Thank you, Monica. I am so excited about today's um, Science of. This is going to be a really exciting one. Uh, my name is Amber Schultz. I'm the Wildlife Education Program Manager here in the Fish and Wildlife Education Division at Game and Parks. And I am excited to learn more about these adorable little critters. So thanks, Monica. Um, I will be here to be answering any questions in the chat. So if you have any questions as she is sharing some really fascinating um, information, feel free to put your questions in the chat. She'll also pause in certain, um, um, certain points to listen for questions. And so then if you have them, we can answer them then and also at the end but I'll be doing my best to answer them during um, her presentation in the chat. Okay, thank you. Awesome, thanks Amber. So yeah, if you have any questions, we'll certainly get to them and there will be a point at the end too where we open it up with questions. So I think some of you have been on here before, but if you haven't, welcome. Um, we only have this one and then two more left um, for this. I guess season, if that's what you want to call it. And then we will start up again um, at the end of August. So with uh, six or seven, I can't remember off the top of my head, six or seven new different topics. So um, there's still a lot to learn out there. So, all right, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about, like I said, shrews, voles, and moles. So um, I, I mean, I pick these topics, so I'm excited about all of them, but I, when I was going through the research on this, I was like, oh, I can't wait to tell people this. I'm so excited. It's so neat and interesting. And so um, this is a big kind of contrast from last week when we were talking about trees. So here we are talking about um, trees one week and then things under the ground the next week. And next week, we're going to be talking about nature differences. So animals that kind of look alike, but not quite alike. Um, so lots of different kinds of topics here. So today we're going to be talking about the little brown sometimes often brown, black, gray, little mouse-like things that we see um, under the ground or um, on top of the ground. Uh, we will um, talk about them all today. So, all right, we'll get started. Um, so just uh, as always, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to utilize the chat um, and put your um, topic related questions in the chat. Just be nice to everybody. We do have the right to remove you if you are not being very nice. I'm sure we won't have a problem, but we always do have to mention that. Um, another thing I do want to mention, as always, I am not an expert by any means in any of these subjects. I really love science. I do a ton of research for these. Um, um, programs and we pack a lot of it into an hour. So um, we do go fast and we do have a lot of information to get out there. Um, if you don't, or if you do have a question that I can't answer or Amber can't find it, um, we will certainly help you get that answer. We will ask somebody that is quote an expert in shrews, bulls and moles. Um, we, will, we will find one for you, so. All right, so I want to talk off, uh, start at the bat here with shrews. Um, this is probably out of the three, uh, probably the least well known um, of these little brown critters that we're going to talk about today. Um, when you hear a lot of things about shrews or you call someone a shrewd person, it doesn't really sound like it's very good. Um, people just don't know a lot about these animals, so we're going to talk about them um, right off the bat here. So what is a shrew? So there's lots of different types of shrews in the world. Um, they're very small. They almost look like a mouse, but they are not related to mice really at all. Um, but they're very small, little um, kind of brown, gray, black, uh, dark brown, little animals. And kind of one of the characteristic things about shrews is their long snoots or their snouts. Um, they're movable. Um, one thing that's kind of neat is there is an elephant shrew out there. And if you ever go to the Omaha Zoo. Um, they are up in the jungle area. They used to be in the jungle area um, and they're called an elephant shrew and they have this really long elephant-like 
um, trunk kind of nose, um, but they're actually related to elephants. So they are very distantly related, but still related nonetheless um, to these animals. And so a lot of people think they're rodents. They are actually not rodents. So um, like I said, one of the most characteristic things about a shrew is they will have this really long um, movable snout. Um, their fur is usually uniform in color. They don't have spots or stripes or anything like that. They have extremely small eyes. And so if you look at this photo here, here, it almost just looks like a little piece of hair is missing. That is their tiny little eyes. Um, they have very small ears. I know it's hard to see, but they do have very small feet as well. Um, they have five toes on the front and five toes on the back. They do have claws. And then one thing, another thing that really distinguished these um, animals from, uh, let's say, a mouse is that they are insectivores. So they do not feed on things like berries and grains. It is insects or invertebrates. So um, they are voracious eaters, and we'll talk about that. Um, but they are in the family, the Sericidae family. Um, so again, not in the rodentia. Um, they are not rodents. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of shrews, like we talked about. About 40% of all species live in Africa, um, but they are also in the northern hemisphere as well. Nebraska itself has technically six species, but really in reality we have five. So what do you what do you mean when I say, well, we have six, but we have five? Well, what we're talking about is one of them has one record ever. We have to count them saying that they're in Nebraska, but there has been one record ever of this one, and it is called the Dwarf Shrew. Um, it was found in the extreme western Sioux County. Um, so when we talk about these animals coming into these extreme parts of the state, it could have been an accident. Someone could have released it. There's a multitude of different things when we say that we have one record of it. So um, being a reptile person, we always get these, we have one record of this, or they came in in the very southern border of Kansas. So we get a lot of them. Um, but otherwise, ones that we do have in Nebraska, whoops, um, we have one called the Mast Shrew. That one is going to be one that you're going to find statewide. Um, that's the one that I have right here. This is actually a juvenile, um, so it's even smaller than a than an adult shrew. We also have a Merriam Shrew, that one single record, that dwarf shrew. We have a northern short-tailed shrew. That one's also pretty common in the northeastern and north central, about two thirds of the state. We have what's called the Elliott short tail shrew and then the North American least shrew. This one's also pretty statewide, except for, sorry if any of them is in the southern panhandle area, but um, otherwise we're, we're pretty shrew um, variety. Uh, we have a lot of them. So we have technically five different kinds. Um, so one of the things that's really neat that you can't necessarily see on a shrew if you if you look at them is their way their skull and their teeth are kind of arranged and what they look like. So um, here's a photo of a shrew skull. Um, so very, very small. This is obviously not to scale, um, but compared to rodents, their skull is very long. Um, you saw their face, you saw their nose. Um, they lack something called a zygomatic arch. Um, which is um, kind of right where their eyes usually are. Um, so um, sometimes people uh, get it mixed up with the Sagittarius crest or the sagittal crest, which is if you ever have a dog, we call it smart bumps. Sometimes people call them smart bumps up here. Um, but they lack this zygomatic arch, um, which is characteristic of rodents. And so they are not rodents, so they don't have that. Um, their teeth are extremely sharp and they're small, but if you think about it, they're eating things like insects and very hard exoskeletons and they have to pierce through that. So um, they're not eating seeds and grasses. Um, another thing to kind of help ID some of these shrews is there's the red tipped shrews and the white tipped shrews. So looking at their teeth is going to be a huge way to distinguish the two of them. Um, so there are shrews that have literally red tipped teeth and shrews that have white tipped teeth. Um, so we think what's going on is that it just kind of depends on where their origins were, if they have red or white teeth. Um, basically what the red part does is that it is just a deposition of iron on the outer enamel of their teeth. So um, 
If they have it, we think what's going on is that it helps resistance to wear. We talked about they're eating things that are gritty, they're hard, they're abrasive. So their teeth are gonna actually get worn down very quickly. So if they're eating those things and they have those red tips um, on their teeth, they we think that it's gonna help them less wear their teeth down. Um, what's kind of interesting is that um, shrews during embryonic development, they actually have a set of teeth when they are let's say getting developed, they will absorb or reabsorb them and then make another set of teeth before they're even uh, born. So they come out with their full set of permanent teeth at birth. Um, very different than humans, obviously. Um, and this is super helpful um, for taxonomic ID. So if you see a shrew, you can identify it. You can look at range, the tail, the color, their feet, all these different things. But then another thing that's super helpful is looking at their teeth. Um, and so the shrew is small. It's a very, very tiny little animal. They have a very high surface to volume ratio. So this simply means that they're going to lose body heat very quickly. Um, so their metabolic rate, which is basically just the amount of calories that your body needs to maintain just to rest. Um, it goes away very, very quickly in a shrew. Um, but if you think about it, they're tiny. They're kind of like the hummingbirds of the mammal world, I guess. Um, they have been recorded with over a thousand beats per minute um, as far as their uh, heartbeat goes. So they're burning a lot of energy and so they need to eat a lot. Um, in certain northern species, um, the skull, um, the skeleton, some internal organs, they will actually shrink them them down in the winter just to reduce those energy demands. So they don't want to have to go find a bunch of food because there's sometimes not a lot of food available. So they will shrink their internal organs and their skull and their skeleton just so that they don't have those high of energy demands um, because there's not a lot of food in the winter time. Um, red tooth shrews also have a higher metabolic rate than the white tooth ones. Again, we think this is simply because of the origins and where these animals come from originally. Um, a lot of these animals, they can only survive about three to four hours without eating. Some species, they can only survive about an hour without eating. Uh, sometimes I feel like I can relate to this really well because, um, I mean, sometimes, you know, you're hungry every hour, every three hours. So um, it makes sense. All right, so shrew, they are very small, but they are mighty. So um, some of these animals, um, not talking about ones in Nebraska per se, but some species of shrews that live in very hot, very arid environments like the desert, they will lower their metabolic rate to survive. So they don't want to burn a lot of calories. They don't want a lot of energy demands. It's hot outside. They burn more calories. They have to find food that's not available because it is hot outside. Um, and some species actually have the ability to go into torpor. Um, so not quite hibernation where it's a long-term uh, solution to a problem, but torpor is just going to be short little bursts of sleep so that they can um, kind of reserve some of their energy and reserve some of their calories. There are aquatic shrews, so shrews that will swim in the water. Um, some of them can hold their breath up to 30 seconds when they're finding food, um, and they have these really cool stiff hairs on them um, that will increase the surface area and also help them with propulsion when they're swimming. So the hairs will trap water and they also help them literally to walk on the water. Um, same kind of concept for those that live in very hot areas. The sand gets very hot on their feet. Um, so they have these little tiny little hairs that help them run on the hot sand. Um, we did talk about their eyes and, and you can see in this photo, they're very small. Um, they have very bad vision, they don't really need it, but their smell and their hearing is acute. Very good. And then kind of a fun fact here, the smallest shrew in the world is called the pygmy shrew. It weighs less than even two grams, which is 0.1 ounces. So very, very small animals. All right. There is something called an armored shrew. We do not have this one in Nebraska, but um, one thing that's really neat about them is we think they're very fragile being so small and little. Um, this guy, the armored shrew, gets its name because it literally has these interlocking um, vertebrae that form together. So the sides, the back, the front, all of their spines on the vertebrae, basically they make it more sturdy um, so they can even withstand being stepped on by a full grown man. Um, that is how uh, sturdy their vertebrae is. So it just interlocks together to make it more rigid so that if something steps on them or tries to eat them, they have a little bit more rigidity in their skull and their skeleton. 
Um, some of them will make noises, which is kind of neat. Um, there is one called the house shrew. Again, we don't have this one in Nebraska, um, but they make this sound kind of like a, a jingling coins. Like if you have coins in your pocket, they call it the money shrew um, because they sound like coins. And then some species even um, will use ultrasound. So something that's higher than the very audible limit that humans can hear. Um, and it's also a form of echolocation. So when we think of echolocation, we automatically think of bats. Um, sort of like bats, um, but they're looking and, and um, trying to kind of identify their surrounding as it's a sensory thing. Um, also, these are very, they seem very primitive animals. The earliest known fossil was about 45 million years ago that we found, um, but they've been extremely successful and they haven't changed a lot in those 45 million years. They're insectivores, they're very small. And one thing that's neat about them is that some of these species have a very high um, chromosome variation, even between males and females. Um, they have different numbers of chromosomes. Um, in this one shrew, the house shrew, it's been studied a lot. They can have any differences between 20 to 33 different chromosomes within the same species. So not saying this is two separate species, but just one species alone can have different numbers of chromosomes. And for mammals, that's very strange. All right, so foraging, we talked about they have to eat a lot. Um, they basically do not care what they're eating, but they will eat a lot and a lot uh, quickly. So um, a lot of them are just opportunists. So if it falls in their hole, um, basically they're gonna eat it or try to eat it. Or when they're running around, um, they make these kind of rodent pathways or you might see voles make them or mice make them. We'll talk about that here later. Um, they're basically just running around and they will haphazardly basically find invertebrates and eat them. Uh, we talked about these aquatic shrews. They will um, dive for more than 30 seconds just to find some small fish. And then something called a pied bald shrew will feed on lizards. So lizards are going to be a little bit larger than the average shrew. So how do you subdue this huge lizard and eat it when you're so small? Well, some of them are venomous. Um, so the one of the only venomous mammals, um, if you know the platypus that lives in Australia, they also are technically considered venomous. They're little spurs. Um, but again, not here, we're not gonna worry about them today. But the ones in Nebraska are mildly venomous. Now don't freak out if you find a shrew and you get bit. Nothing's really going to happen to you. You might have a little reaction, might puff up a little bit on your skin at the bite, but you're going to be just fine. If you are a grasshopper or a earthworm, you might be in trouble though. Um, the American short-tailed shrew has enough um, venom inside its salivary glands to kill 200 mice by intravenous injection. Um, that's just kind of how they've measured it. The venom basically is just there to kill or paralyze that food before they ingest it. Um, it's used to subdue larger prey or even to immobilize them and cache them or store them and then eat them later. Um, with small mammals, rodents, that kind of thing, caching food is very common. Um, this is simply when supplies are low, like in the winter time or coming to the winter time, or if the competition is really high. So if there's a lot of animals in a certain area, they're going to start caching their food so they make sure to have some for later. All right, shrews, whoops, shrews are, um, they're, they're kind of, um, I guess they're kind of social sometimes. It just depends on the species. Again, this house shrew, we don't have them in Nebraska, but they've been highly studied. They're very promiscuous. They found that um, they're only in um, basically in heat for about two hours. And so one study had showed that um, females accepted eight males and they copulated 272, 278 times in two hours. Um, so they're very promiscuous. They have a very short gestation period, about 30 days. The litters can range from two to four. When they're born, they're very small, they're naked, um, they can't see, um, but they really develop quickly because then they're gonna be on their own. Uh, something that's kind of neat about these animals is the mom and babies will exhibit this thing called a caravanning behavior. Um, this is to help them understand where the tunnels will go. So basically what happens is the mom will lead the way and all of her babies will follow her and they will actually bite onto each other to hold on to each other, um, to caravan and to figure out where they're going. Um, so they, it's just kind of like elephants gripping each other's tails, kind of the same thing. Um, what's kind of neat is that people have actually pulled out females before and when they do that, all of the little babies are still stuck to her because 
they have a grip so hard, they need to figure out where they're going and they don't want to let go. Um, so they're very ter territorial. They will defend their territory their entire life. Um, only time they really come in contact to some of them is to either fight mate or if they're in that nestling stage. And then the American leash shrew, um, sometimes they have been found that they're colonial so that they will huddle together to conserve that body heat in the winter time. So some of them are gonna be social, some of them are not. It just depends on the species and the climate that they're located in. All right, and tunneling. So some species will dig tunnels. Um, the species in Nebraska will. So they defend their tunnels and their territories. Um, the water shrew, we do not have these in Nebraska, but tunnels are super important because this is how they squeeze the water from their fur. And it also helps to maintain their conditions. Um, the tunnels will be where they avoid predators. This is where they're gonna cache their food. They usually have more than one entrance simply because if a predator gets in there, how do they get out? So they have to have another entrance. And then in this entrance of this tunnel, they have nests of grass. And this is where they're gonna spend their time resting, sleeping, giving birth, that kind of thing. Um, but they do not create these surface mounds like you would think of as a mole. So if you see these huge mole hills sitting up, that's gonna be a mole, not a shrew. So they make tunnels, but not mounds. All right, so that was a lot of information. So are there any, we'll kind of pause here. Um, yeah, Monica, we had one question and I didn't realize this is brand new research. And so I found a cool article and shared it, but um, Gaurav um, asked, how can a shrew shrink its skeleton in the cold? I think you mentioned the red tooth shrew did that. Yeah. Um, if you want to comment, you can. I found uh, an article when that, brand new research came out, which was only a few years ago. And the, and the researchers said, um, it's actually still a little bit of a mystery, it seems, but the changes in cranial size tend to be unidirectional and finite invertebrates. But the, um, there's evidence that the shrew's brain case shrinks when the joints between the bones of the skull reabsorb tissue during autumn and winter. And then as the spring approaches, that bone tissue actually regenerates. Huh, that is so cool. Really interesting. But yeah. they are still wondering and curious about how does that affect that shrew's cognitive abilities and there's future research on that, which is so cool about science. When we discover more things, there's usually more questions and that's how it goes. So yeah, um, yeah. Any, absolutely. Any comments on that question, Monica? Because then there's um I, I actually didn't know that. So that is kind of cool. I just read that they, I read one little line that says that they can shrink. So I wasn't exactly sure how. So thanks for finding that. Um, yeah. It kind of makes me think of um, a few weeks ago, we talked about birds and like chickadees. And we talked about how they will actually delete part of their memory. Like mm -hmm. how does that to, to store more um, information for their caches? So it's like, it's kind of cool. It's not even the same thing at all, but. Yeah, but it's really, yeah. It's, yeah. There's something there. That's really yeah. neat. And then Kevin shared, uh, not a question, but an observation. Shrews have a very distinct musty shrew order, uh, odor, which is interesting. Um, I'm not, we're not gonna ask him how he knows that, <laughs> but, but that's kind of cool. Um, I know that um, I've done a lot of small mammal trapping and in-pass stuff with my career. And, and Monica, you probably have too, you know, during college. And I remember distinctively spending a whole summer doing small mammal trapping for research and walking up to certain traps before and actually knowing a species before I even open it because based off of just the, the odor. Yeah. yeah, not necessarily shrews, it was a grasshopper mouse and they have a very distinctive odor, but that's a really interesting, um, like, you know, an observation. Yeah, of yeah. I, and I didn't know that shrews had that odor, but I definitely read that voles have a really um, bad odor as well. Um, so that's kind of cool oh. that shrews will have that too. Oh, um, Mary asks, do they prefer urban or rural setting? And I'm assuming, we're, yeah, we're talking about shrews right now. Yeah, um, from what I saw, Mary, is that they like both and it kind of depends on the species. They're pretty adaptable. So there are some that have actually um, adapted in certain, especially certain other countries um, with humans. Um, the only thing that they're worried about now is those really small kind of endemic species or species that are only found in a certain area. They have adapted so well to humans. So if human population gets you know, out of control or the, they reach the carrying capacity, they're worried about how that's going to work with the shrew. So I, my answer is both. There are some that are really adaptable to humans and some that probably could care less about humans. So good question. Um, just FYI, um, I've seen one right here in our parking lot at headquarters in, in, in Lincoln, Nebraska, Monica. Yeah. And, and they're definitely, I mean, it was a dead one, unfortunately, but, but still, it was a shrew. Yeah. 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 
All right. And it, something also that Ryan made me think of that, Amber, is um, a lot of the research that I did, it was saying that um, shrews will oftentimes die of starvation. That's like the number one thing is they die because they can't get food quick enough. Um, so I know when we did those small mammal trappings for class and stuff, we would always have to worry about, you know, yeah. catching some grasshoppers for those animals because they simply cannot go that long without it. So when they see shrews kind of just dead, they always assume that starvation because they just couldn't get food quick enough. So that's just Absolutely. how important food is. That's fascinating, that metabolism. Yeah. And the, your reference to the, the hummingbird of the mammals, I thought that was spot on. That was really good. Yeah. And something else I've always remembered is our mammalogy teacher. She always said that they were like the Tyrannosaurus Rexes of the like small mammal world too, because they just were ferocious eaters. And, that's kind of and cool. so primitive. They're really, they're really close and really um, similar to like that early proto mammal. Yeah. Kind of cool. yeah. Okay. Carry on. Sorry. We're getting so excited about shrews. What's up? Like what another is nature nerd night here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> All right. So we'll go ahead and move on to moles here. So a little bit different. We're going to be talking about moles. Um, these critters look very different than shrews. They kind of have the same um, facial structure, that kind of movable looking snout on them. They're about the same size, maybe a little bit bigger on certain species, um, but they, most people know them because uh, they think they're pests. A lot of times they will make the these mole hills, they'll make these strings of holes and mounds, which people do not like as far as like um, golf courses and their backyards and parks. Um, they are subterranean, which makes them very difficult to study. And so a lot of these animals, actually, we don't have a ton of research or the research is fairly new. Um, so it's only within the last about 40 years, people have really started to study these animals and get kind of a perception of their life and their morphology, just because we don't see them very often. So a lot of people believe moles are blind. They are not. They have very poor eyesight just simply because it's dark in their tunnel and they don't really need to see, but they're not quite blind. Um, they have these elongated cylindrical kind of bodies to help fit in those tunnels. Um, their snout is often very long and it's often naked except for those whiskers. So you can really see right here all these really thick stringy looking whiskers on their face. Those are all sensory organs so that they can um, kind of figure out where they're going. So they have a little visual acuity like we talked about, um, but a lot of it is hidden in the fur um, and their eyes, for instance, basically they're just extremely sensitive to light changes. So is it light or is it dark? That's basically what they see. Um, their snouts are really where they get their sensory um, from. All right, so moles, do we have moles in Nebraska? Yes, we do. Um, they are actually in the same order as shrews, um, but a different family. So these are not gonna be rodents. They are insectivores as well. And we have um, kind of two different subspecies depending on where you are in the state. They're both technically the Eastern mole, but they're just a little bit different subspecies. So the Eastern mole here is found in the two thirds of the state, that Western one. And then we have the, um, again, Eastern mole found in the Eastern part of the state on the other one third of the state. Um, in the world, there are 42 species of true moles, but we only have really two, one, whatever you want to call it in Nebraska. All right, so mole morphology. Uh, technically, they originated in Europe. So their fossil record dates back all the way to about 45 million years ago, which if you remember and were listening about the same time as shrews. Um, today, they, however, they are spread out throughout the world, Europe, Asia, North America but they are absent from Africa because that niche is already filled with golden moles. And Amber, I believe you were the golden mole person when we went to Africa. I, I was just gonna say, I was yeah. thinking, our, Monica and I both went to Namibia together during college for a field um, study and we were on the golden mole patrol. So when we were in the I desert- I forgot we about the golden mole patrol. So yeah. yeah, but we'd never found them unfortunately. So yeah. um, next time, right? Next time, definitely, yes. Um, so they're in a different family. They're technically moles, but again, just a little bit different than these Eastern moles. Um, so when you look at these guys, their forelimbs are adapted for digging. They're almost like these huge oars. Their hands are permanently turned outward um, so that they can dig and move through the soil. Um, they're very large, strong claws. Their teeth aren't really specialized. They'll pretty much eat anything like those shrews. And they have very, very thick fur that will stick up straight so that they do not get soil trapped in their coats when they're going backwards and forwards in their tunnels. 
All right. Um, so moles, these guys will dig permanent tunnels, a little bit different than the shrews, but this is how they obtain their food. So they will dig, 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 dig. And then if something falls in front of them, like an earthworm or a grub or a beetle, something, they'll scarf it up. Um, so they're insectivores, very similar to those shrews. They do not eat things like grasses or leaves. They're going to be eating insects invertebrate kind of things. Um, basically, they're going to eat whatever they find. Earthworms, they really seem to favor those. Beetles, fly larvae, and slugs are also something that they like, which um, if you are interested in having a nice lawn and a pretty lawn, you don't want those things, especially the larva. Um, a lot of times, kind of the grub kind of things, you don't want those. So thank a mole, but then I know you get the mole hills as well. Um, they can consume up to about 25 to 40 percent or more of their body weight in food every single day. So that's a lot of stuff. Uh, one study even found that one mole ate 140 grubs and earthworms in a single day. Um, I don't know how many of each, but it just said 140 grubs and earthworms. So that's quite a few. Um, they also eat around 50 pounds of food each year. Uh, so these guys, they also will die if they're deprived of food. They can last a little longer though. They can go about 12 hours, unlike the shrews, which are about three to four or even one, depending on the species. All right, so this is what a typical mole hill looks like. Um, so normally moles will live alone, but they can have these extensive burrow systems where they're all connected. They really favor um, kind of cool, moist soils near the surface. They burrow year round, but they really peak about now, May through June, so you might be seeing them. Um, so what is a burrow? A true burrow is when moles will search for food near the surface and it causes these huge raised um, ridges that you're gonna see here in this photo. Uh, and there's two types of burrows. If you've ever watched a mole or seen a mole um, tunnel system, you will notice there's ones that has like no apparent direction. This is their feeder burrows. This is them searching for food. The travel burrows, they're more direct um, and they're long and straight, so you know where they're going. And then these mounds that you see, they usually will do this under solid objects like sidewalks, tree roots, and then they push that extra surface um, soil to the top. So a lot of people sometimes, is it a mole that I'm seeing? Is it a gopher? So moles are going to have these conical shaped mounds like you'll see here. And then gophers are going to have a little bit more flat kind of fanned out um, mound. So is it a gopher? Is it a mole? It's kind of easy to tell now that you know the shape of the mound. All right, so reproduction. So female moles, um, they have very small litter, actually one litter every year, about three to four. Um, we don't really know a lot about them. We know that they have an estimated gestation of about 42 to 48 days. Um, at least in Nebraska, they're born February through June. Um, females will make a lined grass nest in the bottom of the tunnels, deeper areas. Um, again, we really don't know much about them. We think they might live about three to six years. They rarely come to the surface, so they're pretty protected from predators. Um, however, foxes and coyotes, um, they can dig out moles from the top. And then something else they have to worry about is snakes and badgers underground. But again, look at these claws. They're not necessarily sharp for protecting themselves. Those are for digging. So this is a prime example of how cool their claws are. All right, I do want to mention this guy just because they're so cool. We do not have them in Nebraska, um, but they kind of look like a tiny little octopus on their face. They're called the star-nosed mole. They're nearly blind, not quite, but they are the world's fastest eater. They can eat an insect or a worm in a quarter of a second. Um, which is really neat. Um, when tuttling, they will like bob their head up and down in a constant motion. This is them just um, using that that thing on their face, those sensory organs to find their food. Um, so they actually have each one of those little tentacles. There's 22 of them. They move independently from each other and they're called um, rays or their appendages. So um, one thing that's really, really cool about them is that they can touch in 10 to 12 different places a second. So they get so much information into their brain. And to get that information, they have to have nerve fibers. Um, they have about 100,000 nerve fibers um, that send information to their brain. We have a lot in our hands. We have 17,000, so not even close to the amount that moles have here. Um, they're five times more um, touch sensors in the human hand uh, or than in the human hand. And they're all packed into this tiny, tiny little nose that's smaller than your fingertip. Um, they're also one of the only of two animals that can smell underwater. 
if you ask me what the other one is, I'm sorry, I don't know, um, but they blow bubbles and then they will suck them back in and that's how they smell um, to find their food. So snails, um, small little fish, that kind of thing. And they can blow about five to 10 bubbles per second and then suck them back in. So we don't have them in Nebraska, but they are so cool. I wanted to mention them. All right, so that was a lot of information about moles. And now we're gonna move on to voles. Um, but Monica, do you have any questions? Yeah. Really quick, where do star nose moles live? I forget. They're just, I, oh gosh. The I, MVPs of the animal world, my goodness. Yeah. Um, I don't, I'm so sorry to stump you, I didn't mean to. But no, I'm that's sorry. totally fine. Africa, I, I added this last minute, so I actually didn't actually pay attention. I want to say that they're in the United States, but we don't have them obviously in Nebraska. Yeah, uh, they're they're so found cool. in the northern parts of North America, it says. Okay. But, um, good question. Yeah. Okay. So um, they are just the coolest. Um, it's like almost having a sixth sense. Like I, I can't even imagine. You know, but that's so neat. Okay. So we don't have any questions, but we had some cool comments from Kevin Barton who seems to be maybe like even a, an expert in the room. I was room. saying, he, Kevin, are you like a mole or shrew mole vole expert here? Well, he, he said that he studies um, some different, some different um, voles. Are these voles? The Microtus pennsylvanicus and Microtus or ochrogaster. Are those voles? Yes, Kevin? Microtus will Okay, be. yeah, yeah. And then he, so he commented that mole saliva is also paralytic. Okay. And they have found mole larders with hundreds of paralyzed earthworms stored huh, in them. That's crazy. How cool is that? That is really neat. Huh? Very neat. Um, huh. So Kevin, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, Those thanks for joining us, Kevin. Exciting facts. Yeah. And that's all, all right. I have. Carry on. No, that's totally fine. All right. So we're going to, we have a last kind of group together here. This is going to be our vole. So a little different still. Um, so voles are like the short, stocky, kind of chunky. These guys are going to be rodents. So very different than our moles and our shrews. Um, they're a little bit larger. They have kind of these rounded blunt stout or snouts. Um, their tails are not quite as long as mice. They're a little bit shorter. Um, usually they're kind of two different colors. They're darker on the top. And then as their belly goes, they kind of get a little bit lighter. Their eyes are going to be black, a little bit larger. Their ears, still not quite large, but bigger than like a mole or a shrew, um, they, but they're frequently mistaken for mole, shrews, and mice. Most people might have heard of a mole, maybe don't know what a vole is, and usually don't know what a shrew is. So, um, but these guys, since they are rodents, their teeth are kind of those chisel, that's hard to say, chisel shaped. Um, and then basically the easiest way to distinguish is it a vole, is it a mouse, is by their tail length. So not quite as long as a mouse, but a little bit shorter um, instead. All right, so do we have voles in Nebraska? We do. These guys are in the order Rodentia, so that means that they are in the same um, category basically as things like beavers and mice. Um, they're in a different family, however. So we do have the two different species, subspecies, the prairie voles, um, the meadow vole, uh, two different kinds of those as well, and then the woodland vole. So um, this one is a water vole. It was very hard to find photos of these animals, ones that are especially we could use. So um, I really try to find photos that fit for Nebraska, but um, it was very hard to find photos of these guys. All right, so we're gonna talk about the meadow vole here. Um, these guys will make, um, they're very easily found. Like they really like grassy areas with lots of vegetation, but they can also hang out in areas like stream, ponds, banks, orchards, pastures. Um, females and males are usually the general same size and colors. However, the um, juveniles are gonna be a little bit different colored. So they might be darker, they might be lighter, just depends on the species. Again, smell and hearing are very important for these animals. Eyesight is good, but not fantastic. These guys are herbivores, but it changes with the season um, depending on what parts of the plant they eat. Most species will eat the green parts, but some of them will burrow underneath and eat the roots and eat the tubers, um, the bulbs. Some of them even will eat moss and pine needles depending on what species they are and where they're found. Um, these guys, it's kind of hard to identify them just by looking at them. So people look at something called their microtene teeth. Um, so these teeth, basically what's going on is they have flattened crowns and the prisms of dentin are formed around the enamel and people actually ID them based on the pattern of the enamel on their molars. So you have to be like a vole expert to, to know and how to identify these at times. Um, you can still identify them based on their color range, tail length, that kind of stuff. 
Um, so it doesn't solve all taxonomic questions, but it is a great way to identify them is looking at the pattern of the enamel. Um, they eat a lot, just like small other mammals. Um, they'll eat day and night. They obtain their food by digging. Um, some species, again, will cache their food. And then we talked about those microta species. All of them, since they are rodents, they have continually growing teeth um, because they will eat a lot of abrasive grasses. Um, and it's a lot easier for them to eat them than if they would have rooted molars like other species of mammals. All right, one thing about these guys, they do not live very long, um, maybe two to three months. It is extremely rare if you see one or um, in captivity or especially in the wild, that's over 12 months. Um, 16 months would be like an ancient animal. Um, they also reach their sexual maturity about two to three weeks after birth. So, I mean, they are born, they mate and they go. Like um, that's just how their lifestyle is. So they could only be five weeks old and the females could have their first litter um, they also have very, very high mortality rates. Um, so they produce a lot and they're like mice. Again, they're rodents and they, it's just kind of the way that they are. Um, their breeding season is very variable though. It depends on the climate. It depends on the species. Um, the young, like the other ones we talked about are born blind and helpless. They're born in a nest below ground. Um, Females are also very protective of their young, um, which is usually characteristic of mammals, but again, not all of them. And then one thing I do want to mention is these cute little prairie voles. Um, I usually during Valentine's Day, I do like a animal love program. And I always like to mention these guys because they're so cute. Um, prairie voles, they're, they're monogamous. So when we usually think of um, animals, we think of things like swans and geese and um, all of these kind of monogamous animals. Well, no one really thinks of voles, like prairie voles. Um, so this is very adaptive for them and, and it specializes because they defend their territory um, for other um, animals that want to come eat their young. So it's an advantage for them to be monogamous because there's two people then or two animals then protecting their territory. So they're very faithful. They're affectionate to each other. They give themselves hugs and kisses. Um, they spend a lot of time together. Um, and even if someone comes, they will approach them. They'll chase them away because that's their territory and this is their time together. So very cute. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting though is there is some, um, I guess some extra money that scientists needed to spend. And so what they decided to do was test the fidelity of these animals um, under the influence of fermented foods. So basically alcohol, under the influence of alcohol, these prairie voles. And what they did is that they found that males, when they are quote intoxicated, they tend to stray from the female. However, females feel more bonded to their, their mate um, when they are intoxicated. So kind of an interesting thing. They are monogamous unless they are um, under the influence, I guess. So kind of a interesting um, thing that I found. So all right, these guys will also tunnel and burrow. So voles have been known to cause extensive damage um, to some places, especially things like orchards and um, places that grow trees. They do not like these animals. Um, they cause a lot of damage because not only do they tunnel and they burrow, but they will eat the roots underneath and then damage the plants on top. Um, so they build these extensive runways through crops and backyards. Um, they dig very short, shallow burrows, so a little bit different than shrews and moles. Um, and they will also have these underground nests where they will have their babies and where they rest and things like that. Um, even in areas like with snow, they're out all year long and they will burrow kind of through the surface. And so this is a really neat picture. All these little kind of tunnels that you see, those are from what we think are voles. So um, you can see how much just this could be one single animal, um, but they make extensive burrow system, but it just varies with the habitat. All right, so I just kind of wanted to compare really quick everything that we talked about. How do you tell them apart? Um, so, all right, let's kind of do a little quiz here. This animal right here, this larger picture, is it a vole, is it a mole, or a shrew? Go ahead and type in the chat. I'll give you a second here. Is this, what is this guy? Vole, mole, or shrew? This large picture here. Go ahead and type it in the chat. Hopefully y'all were listening. Good. This one's pretty easy. It's that mole. So he has those big kind of oar-like paddles um, for his um, claws and his hands. All right. How about this very, very top right-hand corner here? This one might be a little trickier. Is this a shrew or is this a vole? 
Y'all are so good. It is a shrew. Yes, they're tiny little eyes, tiny little feet, and they're kind of movable snout, little pointy snout here. And then the last one, kind of process of elimination here, is this, what is this? Someone already typed it in. Thank you. It is a vole. Good. So this guy, the blunt snout on them, the little bit longer of a tail, different color. So we got a shrew, a vole, and a mole. Kind of easy um, when you, you know, get a quick glimpse of them, how it might be a little difficult to um, share them or see them apart from each other. Um, I see someone said, do voles, moles, and shrews share burrows? Absolutely, they could. Um, they live in the same types of habitats. Sometimes their range will overlap with each other. So yes, they could um, share. Um, they might not like it, or they might be abandoned burrows, but yes, they could use the same ones. Good question. All right, and then kind of just a little thing here, really quick, sh between mice, shrews, voles, moles. Um, we talked about all this. Shrews, they're not rodents. Voles, they are rodents. Mouse, obviously a rodent. Moles, not. And I won't read this to you, but you can kind of see how, um, you know, they're little brown creatures and it might be kind of hard to tell them if you see just kind of a glimpse of them, but they each have certain characteristics that make them unique. And um, I hope that seeing this today, you kind of learned a little bit more about them and how to identify them if you do see them and if you're lucky enough to see them. All right, and then I think that is it. Yeah, so that was all for today. Next week, we're gonna be talking about nature differences. So these are going to be things like what's the difference between a frog and a toad, the difference between a moth and a butterfly, um, what's the difference between a wasp and a hornet. So lots of different things that we're going to find in nature. We're going to do some comparisons next week. That's Thursday, June 17th from 3 to 4 p.m. Central Standard Time. And there is a separate registration um, for that one as well. And then we only have two more for this season. So it's gone really fast. Um, so next week is nature differences. The week after that, we're going to be talking about sturgeon, which I say that I'm excited for all of them, but I'm really excited about science of sturgeon next two weeks from now. All right. And if you really like science of, we appreciate you for joining in with us. Um, we also will post them all the videos here underneath our YouTube channel under um, the playlist science of give us about 24 hours and it will be up probably by tomorrow afternoon. Um, we also have a Facebook page that you can like. We have a uh, Instagram page where we can like and then also check out just our uh, wildlife education website as well. All right, next week we're going to be talking about nature differences and we will go ahead and open it up. I will stop sharing my screen, but we can open it up to any questions that you guys might have. Um, one question someone had earlier and you did a really great job of having that chart, Monica. I thought that was excellent. And someone asked for that size comparison of the three. Oh, um, yeah. I kind of, I, I mentioned um, that moles and, and Monica, correct me if I'm wrong, but moles are about on average, the ones found in Nebraska, about six-ish inches. I think, um, yeah, moles like are gonna be a little bit bigger, moles and then shrews are gonna be the smallest ones, yeah. So Yeah, so I said um, moles are almost about, the, maybe about the size of your hand, voles are gonna be about the size of your palm and shrews potentially about the size of your thumb. Um, so just to kind of give you, yeah, the, like the scale. Okay. Um, um, something that Kevin mentioned, the, and he studies voles, he said voles can also be identified by the tubercles, tubercles, the pads on their feet, but it sometimes takes many other metrics taken to correctly ID them, including where they, they are found, so taking in their habitat, so that's, that's an yeah. awesome comment. Yeah. Um, Roger asked, and then I think someone else asked too, in general, how do you remove voles other than poison if you if you have some on your property? And then and then to echo that, someone um, said, you know, if you have moles or voles or shrews on your property, what's a good animal friendly way to get rid of them? And I'm gonna, um, if you have some comments on that, Monica, um, I wanna let you answer that, but I, I'm gonna make a comment first. I really appreciate yeah. Roger that you said without poison, because mm -hmm. I will say it's really important to consider not using poison when we're trying to remove animals like rodents or like bulls or like other things from our property. The reason is because what happens is when that animal ingests that poison, they're still a prey animal. They're gonna go off before they die. Unfortunately, they're gonna go off and hang out in your yard or something. And what eats these kind of animals? Our owls, our raptors, and many other things. Um, I've actually seen it. I, I'm a raptor recovery volunteer. So I've actually seen several owls, unfortunately, even in this last month, 
pass away from poison, um, from being poisoned by eating, um, unfortunately, mice that have been poisoned by rat poisoning. So it's really sad. And it's something that you don't see and you don't consider and you don't think about, but definitely consider not using poison because it doesn't just affect those animals. It's going to affect, you know, those birds of prey and other critters. So thank you for asking that. But do you have any ideas, Monica, on, um, you know, during your research on how to, maybe if you have some voles in your yard without using poison? Kevin mentioned you can trap voles and Sherman traps mm -hmm. within limits. But what are your thoughts, Monica? Yeah, I was going to say the Sherman trap idea, but then you get into the, well, how far can I move it and that kind of stuff and where do I take it and that kind of thing. And then will it start another problem elsewhere? So um, I'm sure if you look, there are some natural friendly ways to do it. Um, my first thought was get a bunch of foxes in your yard, but then that probably would not be the good idea. But um, some, there are a lot of things, a lot of animals don't like garlic. Um, it is kind of a natural thing. It stinks. A lot of animals do not like it and tend to stay away from it. Um, mint is also another thing. And I feel like somewhere in there, apple cider vinegar is gonna fall in as well, just because a lot of animals don't like that and it's a strong but natural repellent. So um, those would probably be my, my best guesses. Um, but I, again, I'm not an expert. So, but I, absolutely to reiterate what Amber said, do not go to the store and buy mole poison or things like bombs that you throw into the, the mounds or burrows or something like that. So um, absolutely. So, um, and something that I was reading too about removing those is just consider, you know, what, what's, what's constituting damage, you know, and what's constituting like, oh, this is a little frustrating, um, but maybe it's not this huge damage because, you know, the little tunnels that they, that they make in your yard, um, they're pretty temporary and then by the next year it's going to be just grass again yeah. and then the other thing is just maybe removing habitat they like you know like some wood piles and they like things like that or they like big tall grass you know if you have kind of stuff like that and you really don't want them there um, you can consider kind of removing some habitat like that other than that just kind of considering you know like what what's worth um, sharing your yard if, if it was me this is my own opinion I'd be kind of excited to have some wildlife around me that's a little bit exciting but that's um, just something to consider as well. And see, like my first thought, Amber, is like moles and voles and all those things will bring snakes. And I'm really excited about snakes, but I know everyone does not see? feel the same. So uh, the whole I totally circle get of life. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, like Amber said, they're very temporary. I know aesthetically it is not pleasing um, to have those things in your yard. Um, sometimes, like she said, it's just kind of a um, a thing to worry about. But also something you might consider is do you have things like grubs in your yard? and do you want to take care of that? And then maybe the mole population will decrease. So there's a lot of different kind of things that you could um, to think of. Um, and yeah, I see Kevin said in a peak year, one single acre could contain, um, you know, less than 100 voles and maybe truly impossible to eradicate them. So, or more than 100 voles, but yeah, um, it, absolutely. So it just kind of um, depends on the person too. And Paula mentioned, she said, is this chart avail available to print off? So that chart was pretty cool. I don't know if you wanted to share it as a PDF or something when you yeah yeah you share everything. I was yeah just going to mention that really quick before people hop off here because I know it's almost four but um, I will be sending everyone that registered today a um, evaluation in your email that you use to register through Zoom. I know some things got kind of weird last week. Sorry for sending a couple. It, it was a large document. I think there's a lot of links and a lot of people, um, especially Hotmail, they said they came back and said that it couldn't accept it or mailbox is full or something like that. But if you do fill out that evaluation, there might be some incentive in there for you um, as well. But also we just really wanna improve our programming and I can certainly make that chart a PDF and just screenshot it and send it to everyone as well. So absolutely. So yeah. Well, if there are awesome, any- Monica, that was a lot. Was yeah, amazing. I know. And, and next week will be a lot too. And I always say that just, I don't know, I just find so much cool stuff oh, I love here with everybody, so. Um, but yes, we will um, kind of wrap up here. This will be available if you would like to share it with a friend or watch it again or get some information if you couldn't quite jot everything down. We'll put it on our YouTube, give us about 24 hours, and then we will um, hopefully see all of you next week for Nature Differences. So thank you, Haley. Right. Thanks for joining. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Great job, Monica. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. See you next week. <laughs>